Welcome to The Well Woman Show, where we interview women executives, leaders, and entrepreneurs. And you're listening to The Well Woman Show, where motivated women achieve fulfillment and well-being. You're listening to The Well Woman Show. Well, I try to take time for myself by coming to things like well woman drinks to be accepting of myself no matter what and to step away from judgment as much as possible you're listening to the well women show Mm, you know i'm just you're gonna be in for a good ride i don't think i would have any advice per se because i don't regret anything everything i've ever done i've learned from it one way or another good or bad I think it comes down to being a little bit selfish for yourself, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first and then give what's left. I'm a woman, I would prefer to to tell my own story. My story, though it's very personal, is universal because everything that happens to me happens to just basically everybody, especially women. You're listening to The Well Woman Show. And now your host, Giovanna Rossi. Hi, Giovanna Rossi here, and welcome to another episode of The Well Woman Show where I interview women leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs about their lives and their road to becoming and being who they are today. Toward the end of the show, in a segment called Superpowers for Success, I ask my guest about her superpowers, and the answers are unbelievable. I'm so happy you're here, so thanks for tuning in. In in our self-care, we often put emphasis on our health, our diet, and our hygiene, But what about our mind? Today I speak with the Mindful Center director and mindful meditation expert, Michelle Duval, on dedicating care to our minds, how to mindfully meditate, and why this practice is important for every well woman. Today's topic is mindfulness, and hopefully by the end of the show, you'll be inspired to apply these mindfulness principles to your daily life. I'm going to talk to Michelle about mindfulness, intentional awareness, feeling your breath and being present, all as contributing factors to living mindfully. And Michelle is generously offering a mini meditation guide to listeners of The Well Woman Show, so listeners can download it at wellwomanlife.com slash 004 show. I love the guide because it's really simple and straightforward, and I think you'll really enjoy my guests' insights on the show today. But before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, Leafy Greens. They provide seasonal cleanses and nutrition consultations, and I love them. Leah is the owner, and she does a wonderful 21-day cleanse that literally changed my life a couple of years ago when I first did it. I keep going back to it. I do it like once every quarter, and it's an amazing process. And you can sign up for the cleanse and get a, t- a discount at wellwomanlife.com slash leafy greens. Now to our interview with Michelle Duval. Hey, I'm sitting here with Michelle Duval, and um, we are sitting actually in her home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Welcome to the program, Michelle. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Michelle Duval is the current director and lead instructor of the Mindful Center. She's also the director and lead instructor for mindfulness programs at the University of New Mexico Center for Life. <clears throat> the Presbyterian Health Plex, the New Mexico Heart Institute, and uh, many other places, I think. And so, Michelle, let's start by um, telling our listeners what the Mindful Center is, what, what do you do there, and what is your commitment to women's well-being? Okay. So uh, the Mindful Center is devoted to providing mindfulness meditation trainings for health, healing, and stress reduction. So we teach a lot of times in clinical settings at Presbyterian or at the Heart Institute because so much of the focus of mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is specifically what I teach, mindfulness meditation, is geared toward uh, health and healing. We also do a lot of uh, corporate programs where I teach, for example, at Sandia National Labs or at in the Albuquerque Public School Systems, which we learn how to use the techniques and the tools of mindfulness meditation for you know things like increased resiliency, uh, decreased reactivity on the job, and ability to sustain and maintain mental focus throughout the course of the day. So we kind of uh, are in those little two branches of things, one really devoted to health and healing, and on the other side of the spectrum, bringing in the practices more into the corporate environment. 
a lot of people are used to hearing the terminology mindfulness and meditation, but how do you define that? Yeah. So mindfulness, I, I like to keep things really simple. That's my approach to just kind of keeping things clear and simple uh, instruction. So mindfulness is the best way to understand what mindfulness is, is as intentional awareness. So if I were to clap my hands and you heard that sound, I just made you aware of that sound. So that would be a form of unintentional awareness, meaning you didn't choose to hear that sound or to become aware of that sound. If I were to ask you to <clears throat> feel your breath, you would have to move your mind from wherever it was, whatever it was thinking about. You would choose to move your mind onto the sensations of the breath in the body. So there you chose to become aware of the feeling of the breath. And that would be a form of mindfulness when you choose to become aware. You're intentionally aware of something. Um, and how we practice mindfulness in my world, there's a lot of different teachings and mindfulness has become so popular, but I really fully believe and through my teachers and my trainers, and I've had some of the best in the world, that mindfulness without a practice of mindfulness meditation can so easily just become a word where we think, oh, <clears throat> I really need to be more mindful in my life. So in my world, mindfulness without meditation can so easily become just a word. It's like, we all know we should be more mindful or more aware in our lives, or oh, gosh, it would be really helpful if our coworkers were a little bit more mindful. So the word can get tossed around and it can really lose its meaning so quickly. And really where you get the skill or develop the skill or the capacity to be mindful is in a practice of mindfulness meditation. So what we do in mindfulness meditation is we practice becoming intentionally aware, moment by moment by moment. The mind has such a tendency to be lost in thought. In fact, most of the time, most of our lives, the thinking mind is doing one of two things, either rehashing the past or rehearsing for the future. So if at any time you were to take a look at what your mind is full of, so there's another understanding of mindfulness and ability to bring some intentional awareness in relation to what your mind is doing at any given moment in time. So if you start to pay attention to what your mind is full of, you will start to see very clearly that the amount of time we actually spend present in the experiences of our lives is very, very little. Most of the time in the mind, we're either rehashing the past, conversations we had, arguments, what happened to us in our first marriage or childhood, whatever it is, or the mind has a very strong tendency to be lost in thoughts about the future, rehearsing, planning, worrying, uh, creating anxiety for ourselves or what's going to happen in five years or 10 years or whatever it is. So is being mindful the act of being present in the present moment, the now instead of the past or the future is basically what you're saying? Basically, because if you think about it, the only time you can ever be aware of anything is in the present. The capacity of mind of awareness is only ever functioning in the present. So an easy example of this is if I were to say, you know, see if you can become aware of your feet. And if you become aware of your feet, you move your mind into the sensations of the feet. The only time you can ever feel your feet is in the present, is while you're feeling them. You cannot feel your feet or become aware of your feet five seconds ago. And you can't be aware of your feet five seconds from now. So the only time that ability to become aware is ever functioning is in the present. So awareness turns out to be pretty synonymous with presence. And so is the goal to always be present? No, because then you'd walk around like a zombie and you'd walk <laughs> into burning buildings and you'd forget how to use your car. I mean, the thinking process of the mind is amazing and it's a capacity that we all rely on every single day to get the kids out the door to do our jobs um, the really what we take a look at when we practice doing is opening up a little bit of space between the thoughts so if you were just to walk around all the time in the present you wouldn't pay your mortgage because you wouldn't be thinking about <clears throat> the future at all it's important to do those things but it's also important not to consume our entire lives either back in the past or forward in the future in the mind. It's important if we want to live as rich and full and healthy a life as possible, um, we need to learn and train our minds to be able to become present. And then it becomes a choice. So um, the mind can't actually be in two places at once. It feels like it can. If you've ever had one of those busy kind of scattered mind kinds of days, it can feel like the mind is all over the place. But really the mind can only hold one primary object of attention or awareness 
at any given moment in time. So what this means is when we say feel our feet or feel our breath, we can become aware of our breath or the sensations of our feet, because the mind can't be in two places at once, you can't actually be both fully present for the feeling of your breath and often thought at exactly the same time. So each time we practice this movement of mind into, say, the feeling of the breath, it's like opening up a little bit of space between our thoughts. It's letting go <clears throat> of some of the thoughts in the mind so as to become present. And then what we, what is enabled through a practice of mindfulness meditation is that then throughout the course of the day, you get an opportunity to choose where to put your mind. So if you're hanging out with your children and you notice your mind is still back on your day at work, you have developed that skill of moving your mind into the present. So now you can practice becoming present with your children. And if you're at a red light and you notice in the mind that you're rehashing an argument you had with your sister a couple of days ago and you don't want to be doing that again, you can again go and get your mind and move it into the present so as to practice letting go of some of those thoughts that we decide for ourselves or of no benefit to us and those around us. Really the greatest tool in stress reduction is choice. Choice as to what your mind is holding on to or paying attention to, and then an ability to let go of some of those things that are, that are of no benefit to us. Okay, so I think that there's a lot of research that shows the direct relationship between stress reduction and meditation and <clears throat> mindfulness meditation, right? Um, so it's not so much about convincing people that they need to be doing or, or that it's a, a good thing, right, anymore, whereas uh, probably... Probably a few decades. It was the decades ago. It was harder. Uh, it was definitely harder because now we have the research. It's just the thing that we come up against, and I come up against in every single one of my classes, and almost with every single student, is in these modern busy times. We're just so busy, and we have literally convinced ourselves that the state of our kitchen is more important than the state of our mind, or the state of our inbox in our emails is more important than the state of our mind. So we spend endless amounts of time throughout the course of the day caring for these things like our emails and our meetings and our kids and our kitchen. And not to say that these things aren't important, but a little thing that we've lost sight of is that the importance of caring for the state of our mind needs to be as high on the priority list as brushing our teeth. Every single person, hopefully, uh, spends some amount of time brushing their teeth every day. We're supposed to do it just for two minutes twice a day because on some level we've had that awareness, that realization that teeth are precious. And yet for most modern busy people, we have forgotten that our most precious resource is the mind. And yet our entire life and how we relate to our entire life, how we relate to our kids, our husbands, our wives, our neighbors, our coworkers, the world of nature, how we relate to life is directly dependent upon the state of our mind. So part of the convincing that I have to do, um, and there's a little bit of a challenge in there, is that caring for the mind is as important as anything else we do. Once people start to have, I call it a paradigm shift, when you start to get that, okay, I it's as important as brushing my teeth, which I fully believe. Then it, it starts to become easier for people to do a daily practice, but it's hard to get there until they've started to experience some of the benefits. Mm -hmm. And in order to experience the benefits, you got to do some of the practice. So there's that little bit of a give and pull that we've, as bit Westerners, we've really um, convinced ourselves that it's all about the doing of things and not so much about the care of the mind. Okay, and so for busy Western people, how much meditation or mindfulness meditation is needed in order to see those benefits? Yeah, so it's different. It really is different for everybody. I picked up a book a couple of years ago. I was intrigued by the title. It said um, Mindfulness in a New York Minute. And I was like, oh, great. You know, how do I, okay, I, I could spend a minute a day doing it. And unfortunately, it's just not enough of time spent working with the mind um, a minute a day. So would you really, would you experience some degree of benefit, benefit from one minute of meditation a day? Absolutely. But it's going to be negligible because really anything, any time that you repeat behaviors in the mind, the brain sees that as a form of practice. So, um, excuse me, the more we practice 
uh, stressful states of mind, the more we repeat, you know, anxious states of mind, we just keep getting better and better and better at creating those states of mind. So to counteract that impact that those stressful states has on both the mind and the body, a minute a day, <clears throat> you really aren't going to see that much of a benefit. Um, but honestly, anywhere from, I say from five minutes to 30 minutes a day, consistently, So that's where there's some degree of consistency. So if you were to do, and five minutes is really on the skimpier side of things, to be totally honest, but if that's all you can muster, where you sit and do a uh, five-minute mindfulness meditation practice, and then there are ways that the actual mindfulness practice is something that we do outside of meditation that you can really be practicing all throughout the day. So the research really shows that you get some of the neurological changes and you start to really change um, uh, kind of the central nervous system at anywhere between 20 to 40 minutes a day of mindfulness meditation practice. Now that seems like a lot of time, but what we use in a lot of the programs are guided meditations, and then it becomes a little bit simpler. You put on a 20-minute guided meditation, and then all you have to do is follow the guidance, and most people, if they're honest can find about 20 minutes. It's about the length of time of like a sitcom, 22 minutes and then eight minutes of commercials makes up a a normal sitcom. So if you were just to remove one sitcom that you would watch, you know, in the evening and delegate that time for some meditation practice, you will definitely start to experience the benefit if you do it with some degree of consistency. And by consistency, I mean, you're doing it more days of the week than you're not doing it. Okay. I don't think I've actually watched a television show from beginning to end yeah. since I started having kids. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Okay. And that actually, that um, brings me to asking you, you, you have twin three-year-olds. Mm-hmm. And so I have a couple of questions about what you do as it relates to kids. But um, I wanted to start by ask, by kind of going back to your comment about the mindfulness um, and being present and learning that. Um, and, uh, when we think about kids, people say a lot, oh, it goes so fast, you know, your kids are going to be grown before you know it. And it just goes, you know, really treasure each moment. And it's almost like a cliche, like just everybody says that all the time, but what does that really mean? Like, how can we actually enjoy those moments and not have it rush by? And you think, oh my gosh, what, what happened, you know, what's been happening for the last five years? Yeah. So um, this comes back to uh, what's going on in the mind when you're interacting with your children. So if you watch your mind while the kids are talking to you, while you're at the dinner table with them, while you're helping them clean up their room or get ready for homework, if you watch your mind, your mind is for the most part going to be most of the time a million miles away. And it darts in every once in a while to hear what the kid is saying or to have your response or to, you know, notice that their room is messy and, you know, I mean, you, you come back uh, to the present here and there, that's how you're interacting with them. But it really comes down to this basic skill that us modern busy people have cultivated, which is the skill of being somewhere else perpetually in the mind. And so life goes by in the blink of an eye anyway. I mean, they're going to be grown up fast as can be anyway that's just how time is but it goes by even faster when the mind is perpetually somewhere else while we're experiencing them john lennon had a great quote about this he said life is what happens to us when we're making other plans so if you watch your mind and even and we love our kids so it's not a criticism on us and it's not a point to feel um, guilt or shame about the fact that our mind is somewhere else when we're interacting with the children it's just our habit. It's what we've trained our minds to do. And so in my opinion, this is just another reason to begin to shift this practice of mindfulness meditation up more to the top of our list of priorities. Because I know for myself, I'm a way better mother when I've meditated that day. There's no comparison. I can be so much more volatile and reactive and a couple days ago, I yelled at one of my three-year-olds because he got peanut butter on his shirt. I mean, He's three. That's what three-year-olds do is they get peanut butter on their shirt. And just when you put a clean shirt on them, that's what they do. And here was my mind getting mad at something that a three-year-old just does naturally. And because I, I didn't have that stability of mind in that moment. And so what I do in my practice, when I see those moments of kind of moving into that reactive state, 
I use it as more fodder, as more motivation to get my butt onto the cushion or into my meditation spot and do my daily practice. And then the practice of mindfulness is really about where you practice that intentional movement of mind into the present. So I think part of your question was, how would you actually do that at the dinner table? So let's set it up. We're at the dinner table. The kids are all talking about this, that, and the other. Your mind is going, God, my kids are talking so much, or am I really a good mom? My younger kid seems angry, or my older kid is doing great in school, or whatever it is, your mind is full of thoughts. So here's the practice. If you can begin to practice letting go in those moments while you're at the dinner table, letting go of some of those thoughts about whatever it is, and just come into your body. So feeling the weight, you can do it right now as I'm talking. Feel the weight of the body in your chair, the weight of the feet on, your, on the floor, feeling the breath, noticing any pockets of tension in the body, and just seeing if you can bring them into your field of awareness and perhaps enabling them to be released a little bit. And then what you can also do, and it's a little bit more of an advanced practice, but I teach this in my eight-week uh, MBSR programs, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, is you can actually practice becoming present for the visual experience of your children. So what this means is you practice stabilizing your mind or bringing your mind, moving your mind into the actual experience of just looking at your children. And in so doing, because the mind can't be in two places at once, you're letting go of some of your judgments about your kids, which are happening in thought. You're letting go of some of your judgment of yourself as a parent. You're letting go of some of those thoughts about work or all the stuff you need to do, the laundry you have to do later. And for just a couple of minutes during that meal, you practice this intentional awareness of, I'm going to practice in my mind, letting go of the thoughts of everything else. I'm just going to practice just being right here, right now, in my body, in my breath, and in the visual experience of my children, in the sound of their voices. And that's a really great practice. Hard to do because, um, you know, conversation would not stimulate so much thought and judgment and whatnot. But that's why we do our meditation practice so that we have the skill mm. to be able to turn on that kind of spotlight of our presence and then throughout the day shine it wherever we want to and shine it on our kids um, when they're talking to us. Right. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, it, that, that does make sense. And it's like um, anything, you have to practice it because if you want to be able to use it in the moment that you need it, you have to have the foundation to be able to pull that out. Absolutely. And use it. Absolutely. So do you actually um, teach kids mindfulness meditation? We do. I have a really wonderful teacher. His name is Scott Cameron. He was trained through the mindfulschools.org program. And if anyone's interested in bringing it more to kids or to bringing it into like a classroom setting, mindfulschools.org is a fantastic resource. He was trained out in Oakland, California to bring it into the uh, classroom setting. He taught for over, he's taught teaching for over three years now um, in an elementary school here in um, Albuquerque. And then he does the mindful family classes for um, the Mindful Center. Mm -hmm. So that's a class that teaches children children and their parents. It's not just children alone. Because if a kid is learning it uh, by themselves with no understanding of what mindfulness is from the parent, it's it's not going to function. It's, I love this quote. It's like, um, don't be afraid that our kids aren't listening to us. Be afraid that they're watching us. <laughs> So if you're living a really unmindful life where you're uh, very highly reactive, your mind is scattered all the time, very hard to focus, your child is going to pick up on that behavior. They're modeling us constantly. So if you want to enable and encourage mindfulness for your children, which, I, man, I wish I had learned this when I was seven or 10 or whatever it is. Now I have two little meditation cushions over there for my twins because I'm trying to oh. get them to learn how to feel the breath and sit in a little bit of meditation. Um, but the parents really need to understand what it is as well and do a practice for themselves. And then it can become part of the fabric of uh, family life, which why wouldn't it be? It's, it's a way of more effectively using your mind to create greater peace and happiness for yourself and those around you. Typically, we use our minds in almost the exact opposite way. where We create stress and problems for ourselves and those around us. This is learning how to use the mind a little bit more effectively. Mm. And so you, how long do you do the breath and sitting with the three-year-olds? Yeah. So I do it as a treat, honestly. So I'm going to be just transparency because sometimes people 
Um, everybody has their style of parenting and I, I try not to judge and I'm sharing with you what I do, but I do it as a, a, form, a part of their treat process. So if they do their chores, which they have chores, they have to get ready for bed and they have to put their shoes in their little pockets in their closet, those sort of things. And if they eat dinner, um, then we have treat time. And treat time goes along with like chocolate, you know, hot chocolate. That's part of the treat. And I try and couple a little meditation with the treat. Meaning, yeah. and just for transparency, they get the hot chocolate after they do the meditation. Mm -hmm. So, but it's part of that treat. Okay, now let's do a little meditation. And I'm going to, again, full transparency. We do it for about 10 seconds. I got them little cushions. I had them little custom-made cushions. Oh, yeah. that's so cute. I was going to say, uh, you know, 10, 10 seconds is just about uh, as long as a three-year-old can. Yeah. Um, and I sit with them, and they know, um, you know, I say do a meditation. They know how to put their, you know, they cross their legs, and they sit on their cushion. And one of my guys, I didn't teach him this. He just does it on his own. He puts his hands together like a little prayer. I don't even know where he got that from, but that's what he does. And then we just, we, we count our breaths. And so we just, I say, can you, you know, feel your breath and then say the number and they love to count. And so they, you know, and it's, it's silly. It's, they go, you know, it's not like they're really <laughs> yeah. going in, but they're starting to associate that meditation is something positive. It goes along with the treat part of things. I know I'm impacting their physiology for the better because anytime you focus on the breath, and take some deeper, more expansive breaths. It's a way of triggering the relaxation response in the body, turning off the stress response. So right there, um, I know um, it's helping their physiology. And it's starting to just weave it into the fabric of their days so that it's not something weird. It's just something that we do, like brushing our teeth. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, and I want to ask you, Michelle, about your business, about uh, juggling everything that you do. So we've talked about what you do in your business, but... What about you as a businesswoman and a mom? How are you juggling all of that? And I guess mindfulness is part of that. Yeah. So I could practically cry and I'm totally tearing up just at the question because it's so hard. And I'm just, you know, for full transparency, I'm not like, oh, this is just what I do. And this is, it's so easy and it's, it's challenging. Um, uh, but I never miss a day of meditation and that's that's the truth of it if i'm lucky enough to wake up before uh the kids i go on a program called insight timer i i, I really oh, I use you use insight timer i've got some meditations on there oh. and they were recently bought by a company and they're making some really great changes um so insight timer has like 700 free meditations on it some of mine are on there i i listen to a guided meditation i'd gotten really into um, doing silent practices. And then after I gave birth to my kids, I started to experience chronic sinus infections, right? Had a sinus infection for about two years. Mm -hmm. And I was just on all these antibiotics and just got really unhealthy. And uh, again, for full transparency, my practice held strong for about 11 months. And I was okay mentally. I was sick as a dog. I'd still go out and do the teachings, um, but I was okay mentally. And then it just wears on you. Anybody who's had chronic illness or chronic pain, it just starts to erode the quality of your mind. Um, and so one day I was just really struggling and my dad said, why don't you put it, just use a guided meditation. And I was like, yes, okay, <laughs> I need help. Um, you know, so sometimes as a teacher and as a business leader and a business owner, and as someone who helps other people, we can sometimes forget that we need help as well. Um, but so I, I started using more guided meditations from a variety of different teachers. That's helped a lot. Um, I do have to go through a daily convincing of myself that um, you know self-care and, and these practices are as important as anything else that I do. Because I don't want to raise stressed out little kids. I don't want, you know, stressed out people. I don't want to um, somehow weave into the fabric of my family that... Uh, only doing things and accomplishing tasks is that which is most important. I would never say that to a kid. Mm -hmm. And so part of the structure of things is to, on that daily level, kind of take stock in how we want to be showing up in this precious human life. And we get off path. And it's not a problem that we get off path. I get off path as well. My dad always used to say the problem... <clears throat> 
isn't with getting off path. It's remembering how simple it is to get back on the path. Mm -hmm. And it really is that simple. It can be, I can lose my mind over Charlie getting peanut butter on his shirt. But the more I hold on to feeling bad about that, the more off path I am. So if I can practice acknowledging I made a mistake, because I did, I made a mistake in that moment. Acknowledging that, I said, I apologize to my three-year-old. And then I moved into a practice of letting go so that I didn't miss the rest of the morning with them, worrying about what a butthead I was for yelling at him about the peanut butter 10 minutes ago or whatever it is. So it's not easy. Okay. And you mentioned your dad a couple of times and he um, is your teacher as well as your dad. And he started the mindful center. I just wanted to bring that in because for listeners to know that. And and can you say his name and something? Yeah. So uh, I'm so lucky. Uh, Again, I could well up thinking about it. His name is Jim Duvall. And he, um, you know, 30 some years ago, he was the president of a real estate company here in town and started to develop really serious stomach issues for which they could never locate the cause. And eventually a doctor recommended he try meditation uh, cause the doctor was recommending or noticing that maybe it, it's stress related and actually 65 to 95% of all reasons that people go to visit their doctors are for stress related causes and conditions. So most of the time when we go to doctors, it's, uh, triggered by stress, what we're going to see the doctor for. So my dad started meditating, eventually took a leave of absence from the real estate world. And, you know, this was 30 years ago and became an intern with Dr. John Kabat-Zinn out at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, if you could trace, you know, this whole mindfulness revolution, which is what it said on the cover of Time Magazine last February, um, you could trace it back to one individual. It would probably be uh, John Kabat-Zinn in the West, um, who developed these programs of teaching mindfulness in more clinical settings. And he's also responsible for the vast body of research that's proving the efficacy of how this works for a whole host of health-related causes and conditions. And then when my dad was done with his internship, he thought, you know, the heck with the real estate world. That's that's so unimportant as compared to uh, sharing this practice with people. So over time, he started teaching meditation to realtors. That's where he started. Um, and over time, slowly left the real estate world and started teaching these programs full time. And then I interned with him for many years after the stress of my own job just got too much for me. He taught me how to meditate and it worked. I started to feel better. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God, this really, you know, he'd been telling me all the time it works. But until you kind of see it and feel it for yourself, it's just a concept. Um, so I, then I interned with him for many years, and then when he retired, I took it over at the Presbyterian Health Plex and spread it to some of the other places that we've discussed. Mm. Okay, Michelle, we're almost at the end of our time, but I wanted to um, go into the segment that I call Superpowers for Success. So Michelle, the first question is, what does success in life mean to you? Success in life means an ability to create happiness and peace for yourself and those around you. That would be a successful life to me. And you can do it in any job. You know, some people say, well, I don't have the type of job that I can really, but you can. It might not look like the type of happiness that we're used, you know, gleefully running through the daisies type of happiness. Um, And so in that instance, it would be more like a peaceful quality. But you can absolutely share a peaceful quality of mind with yourself, with your coworkers, um, with your children, with the world around you, with the people at the grocery store. I practice all the time in grocery stores and at Kinko's and just with the people around me. And I feel like I'm doing something meaningful when I share that state of mind with others. How do you do that? What are you talking about? Like at the grocery store? Right. So just like we did at the dinner table with the children, I try and let go of some of my own preoccupations. This great American soap opera starring Michelle that's constantly playing and replaying in my mind, right? (laughs) I try to drop that a little bit and literally just be there for other people. So what does that mean at the grocery store? So I'm going down the aisle. I notice that me and another person's cart are going to need to go in the same space at the same time. And because I'm practicing really being present, I can see that happening. And then I can also see the tendency or the urge within myself to speed up my cart so I can get that space first. 
right? Because that's what we do. We have a certain degree of self-preservation. Even at the dumb grocery store, we're trying to jockey for position and get in the line and whatever it is. And if I'm present, then I can back off and I can give that space to the person and they get to go by me. And then we share a moment and they say, oh, thank you. And I just try and be there with them, look at them and say, uh, whatever, you're welcome, whatever it is. One time, I swear to goodness, and I was uh, so shocked by this, but I was standing in line at the grocery store doing this. I was in line. And most of the time when we're in line at the grocery store, we're, uh, we're sighing and we're, oh, this is taking forever. And yet we've got kale from South America or whatever in our cart. I mean, we've got all this beautiful food that we're able to buy and have access to. And we're all like upset and irritated, you know, with the lines. It's, it's insane. It's mindlessness. That's what it is. So I was practicing just being real present, um, and just going to a peaceful place. And then people can see it on your face. It's not like I'm trying to look all peaceful. I just get there. You know, it's like, look at me, I'm so peaceful. No, you just kind of uh, embody that a little bit. And one woman, she kept looking at me. She was in the line in front of me. And she kept coming back and looking at me. I'd smile at her and she'd look at me again. It was almost like she knew me, but she couldn't place my face. And then finally she said, you know what? I know what it is. You're happy, aren't you? And it was because it was almost like she hadn't seen that for a while. And if you look at the faces around you, nobody really looks all that happy. And yet we've got such terrific external conditions. So we laughed about that. We had a little moment. And um, I try to, like in the grocery store, be there for others Mm -hmm. rather than just always on my own agenda, my own itinerary. Do I get my shopping done? Yes. Do I get it done and maybe does it take me like an extra five minutes? Maybe if I let someone go ahead of me or whatever it is. But to me, that's a successful, you know, life. When I'm in the grocery store, that's my life Mm. when I'm there. And then when I'm at Kinko, there's my life. And then when I'm with students, there's my life. The rest of it is just concepts. If you think of your life being X, Y, Z, those are thoughts. Mm. The life is only ever happening in that present moment experience. So if I want to be have a successful life and I'm at the grocery store, I need to do my practice at the grocery store so that that's, and there's my life. And that's that, that meaningful quality of being present for others. The real question is, were the twins with you <laughs> at the <laughs> store? <laughs> do you take the, the kids with you grocery shopping? Cause that can be really hard. <laughs> it's like torture, isn't it? I've never, I like when people say, Oh, savor this time. It's so wonderful. I'm like, it's taking a long time to be able to go to the dang grocery store in peace, right? So I'm like, let's move, let's get four years old already. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But, um, you know, it is harder, but this is where the skill comes in. And I've been meditating, not to say I'm like super skillful or anything, but I've been meditating for a certain amount of time. And what I do is then I practice moving my mind. So I move it to the kids. I give them little apples. They eat apples while we grow shop. And that helps a lot. So I move my awareness to them. I attend to them. And then I move my mind from them back into, you know, the present moment experience of the person. And then they need something. I move the mind back there. The problem comes is because most people have little to no ability to let go in their mind. Mm -hmm. So when you get exasperated with your kids at the grocery store, it's because you're holding on in your mind to all of your past experiences at the grocery store with the kids. And then each moment they cause problem for you you're holding on to those in the mind and you're going oh this is so the practice is you deal with the problem then you let it go in the mind but that takes some skill yeah and also you're attached to ideas of what should be happening like you you get too attached to like well we were gonna make this a quick trip to the grocery store and all of a sudden it's so long and why can't i you know and so if you can just let go of that not be so attached to what you thought was going to (laughs) happen which you really learn with kids um that makes it easier. And the letting go piece of things happens when you become present. That's how letting go functions on the level of mind because the mind can't hold two primary objects at the same time. When you practice becoming present, you're letting go of those thoughts of, wait, this was supposed to be a quick trip in. And there's how the letting go piece of things uh, functions. Okay, so we have a couple of more questions in the superpowers for success. Um, when did you know you were really good at what you do? Take us to that moment. Um, I have no idea, and I'm not even sure I'm really good at what I do. I have had really good teachers. Um, so one experience that stands out in my mind is there was 
She's no longer teaching in Albuquerque. She's in a different city. But there was this outstanding, amazing meditation teacher teaching in Albuquerque for about eight years. And I would go to her classes. And um, one night, I before I had kids, um, I found myself going to her class, even though I had a terrible stomach ache, even though it was freezing cold outside, I was going to get myself to this class. And I, I remember, it's always stuck in my mind because I had that feeling that I would do anything. It gives me, makes me want to cry to think about it, but I would do anything to be able to share these practices as effectively as I possibly can. And that was a moment where I noticed that within myself a little bit. It was like, I'm going to get to this training because it's going to not only help me, but it's going to help me share these practices with others. Mm -hmm. And so that was a moment where I realized I had that piece of things to go and get the, get the trainings, do the practice, so as to be able to more effectively show. Because when you teach someone to meditate, you, you're enabling them to absolutely and positively transform their life. You really are. And it's my really goodness, powerful. it's so powerful. And you see, I run into students years after and they're, we see each other and our fa you know, their faces light up and they share their like, and I get emails, you know, of just a real transformation. And it's not that they look any different or they're glowing or they never get sick. Those are myths of meditation. I get sick you know, I'm, I got a cold right now. I mean, it's just, it's part of being alive, but the transformation comes in and how we relate to the stuff of life, how we relate to getting sick, how we relate to the kids not doing what we want them to do. And when with some degree of practice, we learn how to relate to this very full catastrophe of what it is to be alive sometimes with a certain degree of peaceful quality of mind. And that changes everything. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. Um, and so just a couple other questions. Describe one personal habit that contributes to your well-being. Exercise. I mean, uh, apart from meditation, because that's the given, yeah. right, um, uh, from this. But I think um, moving the body um, is really a, a thing for me. You know, in meditation is a lot of times done just sitting, although you can do walking meditations and whatnot, but getting some form of going on hike, just some sort of moving the body has become really critical, especially after I gave birth at 40. Um, and I don't feel 20 anymore. I definitely don't. <laughs> um, so that's a big piece of things. Mm -hmm. Yoga. I love yoga. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree that with the exercise, um, it just, it's so critical. It's like, how much should I exercise? Or, you know, how many days a week should I exercise? Well, every day that you want to feel good. <laughs> what superpower did you discover you had only to realize it was there all the time? So I guess, you know, in my world, sometimes I teach 500 people at a time. I have to go on stages or be in front of groups a lot. And I guess that um, an ability to, um, you know, like lead a group or to galvanize energy toward a certain outcome. Um, I used to be in the film business and I made a bunch of short films and for like no money and you know, we never had a budget and I would have to rally the troops. You know, you'd have to have a sound guy and you'd have to have the lighting person and none of them were getting paid and I would need to organize those people to create a certain outcome, which was the short film. And I think I've been doing that my whole life. I put together a talent show projects with, you know, 30 people. And, you know, I, I've always kind of done that. So I think that would probably be something that was already always there. And it, it didn't feel that unnatural to me. Mm -hmm. um, but you start to become real aware of it when you do step in front of larger groups of people and people have paid to come and see you. You know, it's not just like they're what they've paid to be there. What book are you reading right now? Like what's on your nightstand that you want to share? Nice. And this is true. Um, it's a book called um, The Art of Living. Um, it's really good. Um, it's So there's a, a type of meditation called Vipassana meditation. And um, it's very similar to mindfulness practices in the sense that you, 
it's a practice of becoming present for the breath and the body. Um, and they host, uh, the Vipassana group hosts these 10 day retreats and they have for 30 some years in this country and they're free room and board is free for people who want to do the 10 day silent meditation retreat. And each evening, the teacher, I think it's, it's SN Gonka, Gonka, I'm probably saying that wrong is the teacher, but he gives these video teachings to help kind of uh, keep you on path because you don't speak in these 10 day silent meditation retreats. And this book is a compilation of his teachings and some of the questions from the students. And it's so good. It's really good. So that's what I'm reading right now. I've read it a million times, but I keep going back to it. Okay. And last question, what advice would you give your 25 year old self? I don't know. Like that, the, I always find those questions hard because like I would probably give myself advice that at 25 I, w- I wouldn't have been able to take, you know? I mean, I think of sometimes when I would get angry at people and now I don't get angry in, at, in those ways anymore. So like that sense of like lighten up and don't sweat the small stuff. But at 25, I was so stupid. I, I wouldn't have been able to take, I would have been like, yeah, you lighten up. I know what I'm doing, you know? So... um I don't know. I, I'm, I, I really am one of those people who, um, and I think when you meditate and you kind of are practicing bringing awareness to your life, you really do see the need for your travels and for the journey. And I really couldn't, without all the stupid things I did and all the mistakes, there would be no way I could kind of empathize and kind of connect with people on this path of practice. So if I was all together at 25 it would be a whole different thing. Yeah. Okay, I've been speaking with Michelle Duval of the Mindful Center. And Michelle, if people want to contact you, they can go to your website. Yes, so uh, a couple of things. We have uh, the Mindful Center website, which is just themindfulcenter.com. And that's where you go to find all of our classes, our programs. We host retreats. I bring in guest speakers, everything mindfulness uh, meditation related. And then in the next couple of weeks, we're launching a second website called Michelle Duval Mindfulness. And on that website, you'll be able to access free video teachings from me. I also have a web, uh, excuse me, a YouTube channel called Michelle Duval Mindfulness. But this website will really be devoted to um, uh, uh, allowing people to access free video teachings uh, on a whole variety of topics. And the teaching will be three to five minutes of length. You can uh, access guided meditations right on that website. So that'll be something we're launching in the next couple of weeks as well. Mm, exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. That's it for our show today. I've been speaking with Michelle Duval, mindfulness meditation trainer and director of the Mindful Center of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We talked about mindfulness, intentional awareness, feeling your breath and being present, all as contributing factors to living mindfully. You can get the mini meditation guide for free at wellwomanlife.com slash 004 show. Our monthly live event, Well Woman Drinks, brings women together to share our successes and challenges as women, leaders, moms, aunts, sisters, and all the other roles we carry. If you'd like to attend a Well Woman Drinks near you, or if there isn't one in your city yet and you'd like to start one, email me at info at wellwomanlife.com. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and subscribe in iTunes and leave a review. This helps raise visibility, which is super helpful when it comes to producing the show every week. You can also continue the conversation in the Well Woman Life Community group at facebook.com slash groups slash Well Woman Life Community. For feedback, comments, or just to let me know you are listening today, find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Well Woman Life. I am Giovanna Rossi for The Well Woman Show. Until next time, have a super powerful week.